Hey everyone, Rob Young here, AKA Mr. Rob. I'm here with my wife, Sam, today. Hey there, and thanks for joining us for today's training, our top 10 secrets for teaching kids music. This is going to help you guide your kids towards singing more in tune, understanding music, and even for developing your child's sense of perfect pitch. So I am a longtime music teacher, a percussionist, and a kids performer. And I'm a classroom teacher turned curriculum specialist. And between all of that and now running our online music curriculum, Prodigies, we've worked with thousands of classroom teachers, homeschool parents, and early childhood educators to make teaching music colorful, effective, and fun. We get some pretty amazing results by leaning on a few simple guiding principles, methods, and research, and we're thrilled to share them with you here in today's training. To be clear, many of the ideas here today are not our own. Our focus here at Prodigies is largely on turning all of these ideas and methods into colorful curriculum for families and classrooms. And our curriculum is a combination of strategies from popular methods like Kadai and Taneda and Orf. And of course, we have our own little twists and spins that we throw in here or there. Also, don't get nervous or overwhelmed if you're not a music teacher. We're taking these super effective strategies and making them as easy and as digestible as possible today. So even if you don't know much about the musical alphabet or teaching music, today will be a great launch pad for you, and we promise you'll leave feeling more ready to jumpstart your child's music education. Now, if you're a more experienced music educator, definitely stick around. We've done this training with thousands of music teachers over the years, and there's a couple of gems you won't want to miss. Now, if you'd like, we do have our music curriculum that you can purchase. It's $13 a month with a 30-day free trial at prodigies.com. But here today, we're just going to be hitting our top 10 secrets and methods. This is how we guide the students. This is how we create our music lessons. So it's going to be a jam-packed training full of free resources, our favorite apps, research and podcasts, checklists, all these things that you can walk through, check out with your kids to hopefully unlock the amazing musical ability of perfect pitch. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if you're working with kids and you want to teach them music, whether it's in your home or your school, then this is the training for you. A quick heads up, this is all pre-recorded so we can make it as seamless as possible, but our team is often hanging out in our website's chat. So if you have any questions, we can answer you in the chat per usual. If you catch us while we're asleep, we'll get to your question in about one or two business days. You can also email us, support at prodigies.com, or even give us a call at 302-307-1997. Today's training will be about 30 minutes of pretty rapid fire material, but it's always here for you to watch and reference. And we've created an audio version, checklist, and free follow-up materials you can download below. So how do you know if this training is for you? Our specialty is definitely in early childhood and elementary music strategies. So if you're working with young kids, beginners, and children with special needs, there's going to be a lot of actionable takeaways for you. If you work with older kids like a middle school orchestra or a high school band, this training will not have a ton of actionable material for you. There are some awesome little nuggets of information we hear from middle schools and even high schools who use our materials, but the focus here really is on infants, toddlers, preschoolers, schoolers and school age students. And keep in mind that your results will vary depending on the quality and the frequency of your practice. But you can absolutely expect that your kids will start singing more in tune and learning the language of music if you do the activities we discussed today. Our ultimate goal here is to give parents and teachers the tools they need to teach their kids music in the same fundamental way that we all teach our kids color and language. We want to make it easier for kids around the world to learn the language of music in a way that's fun, accessible, and effective. So the next generation grows up speaking music like a second language. And if that sounds a little bold, there are languages, Mandarin Chinese being the most studied example, that actually do give kids, do give native speakers a musical advantage because the language itself is pitch-centric. To some degree, the English-speaking world is at a musical disadvantage. Our language doesn't promote musical development the way a tonal language does. So we hope that these ideas about early exposure to pitch spread far and wide, giving the next generation the fundamentals of music during the years when it matters most. Now, before we look at some of the research behind exposing children to the fundamentals of pitch, I want to clear up three quick questions and then we will get started. Question number one. Do I need to be a trained music teacher? 
No, you do not need to be a trained music teacher to start developing your child's early sense for music. The type of musical teaching we're talking about is going to feel a bit like teaching your kids colors, the ABCs, or how to tie their shoes. Like first words, colors, and counting, we all know from our own personal experiences how to pass down those fundamental concepts. Those same fundamentals of music, the building blocks that make it possible to paint a musical picture, are not nearly as ingrained in our society as the other subject areas. Yeah, we all learn to identify two dozen letters, thousands of words, dozens if not hundreds of colors, but if we were tested on the 12 musical notes here in the Western musical language, most of us would score something like a 0 to 10%. The crazy thing about music is that, as much as we all love it, most parents and teachers don't teach the fundamentals. You've successfully taught your child language from day one without a literacy degree, and likewise, you can give them early exposure to music without a music degree. And as you'll see today, there's really a strong case to be made that this early exposure to music is critical for developing a lifelong sense of pitch. Question number two. Are my kids the right age to start music lessons? Formal music training typically starts around age five or six, but there's a big problem with this. By age five or six, the window for internalizing the sounds of music starts to close. Ideally, you want to introduce the musical notes as early as possible. We'll talk about age-appropriate activities during the training, but the key is to try to get at least two years of exposure to pitch before the age of six. Of course, people of all ages can benefit from a music education, but as with most things, the earlier you can start, the better. Yeah, research shows that even babies in utero benefit from music, and there are many great ways to engage infants with meaningful exposure to pitch. Your child is never too young for a music education. Question number three. Do I need a lot of money to teach my kids music? No! Most of the principles we'll talk about are free or at least affordable. And of course, things like instruments do cost money, but there are some great free instrument apps out there. And if you are looking for a music curriculum to follow, ours is just $13 a month at prodigiesmusic.com. So now that we've got those questions out of the way, let's jump into our top 10 secrets for teaching kids music. Secret number one is meaningful play with pitch during the critical period for auditory development. So this is a big one. It's kind of the one sentence answer to giving your kids a powerful musical upbringing. Essentially, this means that you need to teach your kids to memorize the musical notes individually. Think about how we teach colors, numbers, and letters. We give each of them a verbal label. We play games, sing songs, and above all, practice, practice, practice. These things, colors, numbers, letters, they are the fundamental building blocks of art and math and language, yet we so often wait until elementary school to teach our kids the fundamental building blocks of music, which are essentially 12 different sounds, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, plus their respective sharps and flats. The folks who pioneered the Tineda method back in the 80s studied this kind of musical exposure. And more recently, Professor Diana Deutsch has published fascinating research on the subject. Now, perfect pitch is this musical skill of being able to identify a musical note without a reference, the same way that most of us can do with color, but for the musical notes. See easy. While it's often called perfect pitch or absolute pitch, it's not really perfect. It's more of a memorized sense of pitch. Like all skills, it can be developed and honed, and it may not necessarily ever be perfect. Even a musician with absolute pitch is always refining her craft. This amazing skill shows up in 1 in 10,000 people in the English-speaking world. However, in other countries like China, where the language is based on tone, the rate of perfect pitch is much higher because kids grow up surrounded by consistent and meaningful exposure to pitch. Some words are even universally spoken on the same pitch, on the same musical note, which suggests that humans indeed can develop a sense for memorized pitch when it's a regular part of early childhood. 
Professor Deutsch has shown that Mandarin speakers who receive this regular and meaningful exposure to pitch in early childhood can and will outperform English-speaking children without that kind of exposure by a factor of six or seven. Science shows us that there is indeed a critical time to learn a language before age five or six, and the same is true for internalizing the sounds of music. If you don't get that formative exposure and practice in those early and impressionable years when your brain is rapidly developing auditory and speech skills, it will be very hard to ever develop it. So if you think of music like a language, which it is after all, it's a series of sounds with common patterns and rules and exceptions, then it is critical that you give your kids meaningful exposure to pitch during the critical period for auditory development. Secret number two, fixed labels. The most effective and accessible way of making the musical notes more concrete is to use the solfege hand signs for do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and do. These hand signs help to connect the abstract sound of a musical note to a concrete and easy to remember motion, which in turn helps us to memorize the sound of the musical notes. Plus, the solfege hand signs are totally free, and you have them with you all the time, so there's no excuse not to practice. The hand signs also allow shy singers to engage in musical play without feeling totally exposed. If you're working in a group, you'll see how some kids love to sing while others are terrified. These hand signs help those shy singers stay involved instead of disengaging, and slowly but surely, you will start to see those kids sing with confidence. For kids with special needs, these hand signs can be super helpful. They engage more parts of the body and they help channel your arms and your hands into the music. Every time we hear from a parent or teacher who's just had a massive breakthrough using the hand signs with their kid who has autism, it almost feels like magic. Now we've got a free Solfege hand sign poster that you can download and you can integrate and use these hand signs in lots of different ways. You can do simple call and response singing with little melodies like do, re, mi. You sing do, re, mi and you can go back and forth like that. You can also write little songs together in the car or before bedtime using the hand signs and you can even translate some of your favorite nursery rhyme songs into those Solfege hand signs. The solfege hand signs aren't the only fixed label we can give students. We can reference the notes we hear by note name, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C, scale degree, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or color, red, orange, yellow, green, teal, purple, pink, and red. Similar to the solfege hand signs, singing with these labels will help children internalize the notes. So to recap, tips number one and two with some easy and actionable steps for you to take. Number one, explicitly teach your kids the musical notes like you would teach them colors, letters, or numbers. And tip number two, give kids the verbal labels and identifiers they need to internalize the sounds. This means lots of practice and performing with these solfege hand signs and singing about each note's verbal label. And if you can keep it regular and consistent for two years or more, there's a good chance that your kids will develop a much stronger ear for music. So you can hang up that Solfege hand sign poster in your practice space, in your child's bedroom, or even in the bathroom, and you can practice with those hand signs as often as you want. Secret number three, guided play with color-coded materials. So children learn through play, and it's our responsibility as parents and teachers to guide that play. By using these color-coded materials, whether they're boom whackers or bells, you will greatly increase your child's ability to connect the music that's on the page to the instruments in front of them. Having a color-coded instrument greatly increases the predictability of your instrument compared to a typical instrument. Children don't need to learn how to reliably make a chord shape or find a note on a piano in order to produce that note. They'll know it as easily as they know the color. This brings us to our favorite musical instrument, the C major desk bells, which allow for meaningful exposure to pitch. They reduce the chance for error and they are very durable, durable even enough for a young learner inside of that critical period for auditory development. With color-coded sheet music and instruments, it's reasonable to expect that your child will play the song and experience the correct notes that they're reading on the page. When you have a color-coded instrument or at least an instrument with fixed, 
clear labels, your instrument becomes a lot more predictable. It's gonna reduce frustration, increase your child's enjoyment, and it's going to help solidify the sounds of the musical notes. It's true that color coding is not as difficult as black and white music, but children can learn to read sheet music after the critical period for auditory development. For now, we wanna make sure that kids have as many memorable and meaningful experiences with the musical notes as possible. So actionable steps for tip number three, get a color-coded instrument and some color-coded materials. You can color code an existing piano or xylophone, or you can purchase some bells or some boom whackers. We use the Chroma Notes color systems, which is extremely popular due to the popularity of the boom whackers, and you can find tons of people sharing Chroma Notes sheet music on Pinterest and around the web. You can set your kids up to practice on their own, or you can take some time to guide them through the materials. You can point to the music as they play and encourage them to keep a steady beat. Engaging with them will make the experience a positive one and yield better results. Secret number four, listening games. In order to reinforce pitch development, students should play basic oral comprehension games. The simplest version of this game is to take a combination of notes Tell the students what those notes are. Today we're gonna to get quizzed on red, yellow, and teal. And then we're going to cover up the notes and start quizzing your students. A slightly more fun take on this is to play your child a famous melody like Jingle Bells and ask them what song it is. Our What Song Is It compilation video is one of our most popular YouTube videos simply because kids love playing this game. If you are playing this game, you'll see your kids come to the realization that their favorite songs are more than just words. I love doing this around the holidays with jazz melodies and popular holiday songs that have no words, but some complicated musical arrangements. This makes it a ton of fun, really challenging for their ears. But of course you can do this with any melody or song. Just try to find an instrumental, no lyrics version. The same principle can be applied to chords as well. This is a bigger idea that we teach in our program, but long story short, you want your learners to spend their first three to four months mastering the sound of the C major chord. Then spend the next few months comparing C major and G major chords, and then introduce the F major chord so that you can start practicing chord listening games with those three very important chords. So actionable steps for listening games and oral comprehension. Practice short and fun listening games with your learners. You can do it on any musical instrument or with our free instrument app. And you can listen for random notes within the C major scale or keep it specific to those three chords. You can listen for chords against other chords. You can listen for individual notes within a given chord. And you can also, like we were saying before, play famous melodies in that what song is this type of game. Remember to keep it fun, positively reinforce your learners, and try to casually guide them toward the right answer. Taneda has some pretty specific tips on how they do this in their parent manual, Education for Absolute Pitch. So look for that book on Amazon if you want specifics on best practices for oral comprehension games. Secret number five, call and response or echo rhythms. We focused entirely on pitch so far in this video. That's because there's not nearly enough of a focus on pitch development during early childhood, which is when it has the biggest impact. That said, you will need a good sense of rhythm to really learn how to play any instrument. The benefit of the call and response or echo format is that kids can play the rhythm before they actually read the rhythm. Students repeat the words back to the teacher and it helps follow an error-proof blueprint that helps prevent children from feeling frustrated. So instead of looking at a piece of black and white music and trying to figure out ta versus tt or what rhythm am I reading, the kids are going to hear ta, ta, ti, ti, ta, which is easy enough to repeat they sing ta ta ti ti ta, which internalizes the rhythm, builds confidence, and then when they are ready to start reading the rhythms, they can connect that sound, that rhythm that they learned earlier with the ta's and the tt's on the page. This is a pretty universally understood method for introducing rhythm to kids. We try to make teaching and learning rhythm fun here at Prodigies. We teach variations of ta and tt with songs like Sweet Beats, Za Time, and Snow Day. In these tunes, we use a simple formula for teaching rhythm that's both engaging and effective. 
First, we pick a topic, like say the beach. Then you pick some replacement words or sounds for that ta and tt. So using that beach idea, we can do sand and ocean. Then you practice with those rhythms. You can do some call and response, ocean, ocean, sand, sand. And then what you'll want is to write a bit of a hook or a chorus about that same topic. It doesn't have to be a chart topper, just something fun enough to keep your kids engaged. With that, you've got a fun chorus to sing and those echo rhythms to practice and you'll be off to the races practicing rhythm. The goal here is to get your kids comfortable playing with long and short sounds to help them develop an internal metronome. For some kids, this is pretty easy and natural and they'll be doing it from day one. For others, it can take a lot of consistent practice and that's totally okay. Again, like with pitch, don't stress reading traditional sheet music and rhythms on the page as much as you focus on practicing the process and the concepts through age appropriate play. So actionable steps for tip number five, introduce and practice call and response rhythms. Before you ever show your child what a rhythm looks like on the page, make sure that you have practiced and played that rhythm. Then you can reveal it to them. Show them what they're reading and then try to read it together. You might also start with simple four beat patterns like ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. And then over time you can make longer patterns and pick apart those patterns. You can also write down ta's and tt's on individual index cards and arrange them in new patterns that your learners can clap or tap their way through. One of our favorite teaching tools for teaching rhythm are note knacks. This gives children tangible practice manipulating and exploring rhythms. Secret number six, high information music. This is especially important for infants and toddlers, but there are many benefits for all ages. High information music is music that's generally unpredictable. It has all 12 notes. It's kind of difficult to follow and understand. Think Stravinsky or Rachmaninoff or Charlie Parker. I actually learned about this idea from Rick Beato and the folks over at Neural. So a huge shout out to all of them for all the work that they do. Without getting into a ton of detail, this more advanced kind of music is like eating your musical vegetables. They might not taste as good as pop music ear candy, but they're nutrient dense with tons of high level musical information. Exposing your kids to this more advanced kind of music will help expand your child's understanding of what's possible with music and help get their brains accustomed to more difficult and complex compositional styles. You might also try exposing your kids to music from other cultures. Music like sitar from North India or African drumming are built on fundamentally different systems than we use here in the Western world. Experiences like this will not only help to expand your child's ear, but their sense for what is possible with music. Wrapping up with our actionable steps for high information music, Basically, you need to seek out and listen to high information music. Again, it's music that's unpredictable. It usually features all 12 notes. It's a lot more complex than what you hear on the radio. And again, you can think Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, Charlie Parker, search Aiden Essen Improv on YouTube. That's a great example. Or you can check out the app Neural. That creator Rick Beato has shared some fascinating research on YouTube and it's definitely worth your time. Secret number seven, introverbals. This is sticking with the theme of infants and toddlers for just another minute, but basically it's a complete the lyric type of activity. So even though your six month old probably can't sing and doesn't have a ton of vocabulary just yet, if you teach them some simple songs like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, you eventually will be able to sing the song, leave the end blank, and then your little one will fill it in. Of course, you'll need to sing the song to them a few times before they actually learn what to expect. It might take a couple of days, it might take a week, but give that a shot with your little ones and see if it helps them engage with music and learn some new words. Some great songs that we love to do this with are Mr. Sun by Raffi, Itsy Bitsy Spider, uh, The Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, of course, or really any song that has a decently strong rhyme scheme. That rhyme helps to prime the child's ear for the upcoming word. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you, and then our daughter Lil fills in the blank, are. So it helps with language acquisition and music engagement. And not to mention, it is a really fun and cute activity that your little ones will love and you will all bond through that together. 
So the actionable takeaway for introverbals is to practice simple songs with your kids, just sing those songs a lot to start. Then eventually you can leave the end of those tunes blank and your kids will fill it in. Stick to three, four, or five songs to start. Don't overload your kids with tons of options, tons of vocab. And then when you feel comfortable, again, leave the end of that phrase blank and prompt your child to fill it in. It might take a little time. Even babies and toddlers though will start to do it. And the more fun you can make it and the more you can positively reinforce your kids, the quicker they will be singing along and filling in those blanks. Secret number eight, music and movement. This very popular and familiar strategy is probably what you immediately think of when you think about kids' music. The wheels on the bus, freeze dance, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, where is Thumpkin, Itsy Bitsy Spider, the Hokey Pokey. All these are meant to get your kids dancing a certain way to the music. These songs are great for teaching simple concepts and vocals. They're also a ton of fun and a great way to do some indoor physical activity. Music and movement is also a great way to introduce and reinforce steady beat, whether it's by dancing to the beat or stomping and marching to the beat. Moving to music as different animals will also help teach your kids to alternate hands, reinforce coordination, and even help them imagine different pictures, scenes, and emotions that they can attach to the music. What they're not so good at is actually teaching kids about music, especially through the lens of our number one tip, meaningful play with pitch during the critical period for auditory development. Movement songs will help your kids learn more songs and appreciate music, but they don't actually teach anything about pitch or really that much about music in general. Yeah, so these can be a great way to reinforce rhythm. They're also an absolute must have in your back pocket for any early ed music class. They work great as a warm up or a transition activity, and they are especially good when you've got some calories to burn on a rainy day. Actionable steps for music and movement. Learn the classic finger songs and movement games like Where is Thumpkin and the Wheels on the Bus and engage your kids by using those hand motions and games. You can find a ton of music and movement songs on YouTube and also if you go to a local kids gym or music class, chances are they will be doing a lot of music and movement there as well. And if you want, you can enhance your music and movement activities with boom whackers for things like the tubes on the bus to try and get a little bit of pitch development into your movement games. Secret number nine, modeling. This is an important one, even for non-musical parents. And it's the simple idea of engaging with your kids and learning music alongside them, at least to some extent. If your kids see you enjoying music, whether you're singing or learning an instrument yourself, they may be much more willing to give music a shot. Our little ones love to copy our behavior for better or worse. And by playing music with them, your children will learn that it's okay to be a beginner, to try something new, and to have fun while learning. Teachers model activities in classrooms because it's an effective way to communicate our expectations to children. As an added bonus, if you're the one playing along with your child, they'll associate those positive early learning experiences with you. The best actionable step you can take to model music for your child is to learn a new instrument alongside them. I've seen mother and daughter duets at piano recitals, and I recently saw on Facebook that a whole school of parents learned string instruments with their kids as part of an orchestra concert. That is super cool, obviously a little bit more extreme, but really, really inspiring and proves this point exactly. You can also find a private teacher to provide your child with a close musical mentor or find a local studio or music class. Even if you're using prodigies, this will be someone who can get them involved in recitals, performances, maybe even get them their first couple of gigs. Yeah, I said earlier that I've been a music teacher for a long time. I actually started at age 16, kind of picking up students from my music teacher. I had my driver's license, so I was helping my drum teacher out, working with his youngest students, some of their younger siblings, and even filling in for some of his dance classes. So finding a local musician or music studio for your child to connect with is definitely a smart move, even beyond the actual weekly lesson, which is obviously valuable in its own right. If you're using prodigies with one set of bells, look for the duet, either the filters or simply by searching for duet. These are videos that use a lot of the bells within the C major scale, making them particularly good for two people on one set of desk bells. 
Better yet, if you do have two sets of bells, you can both play along together, or if you sit across from one another, you as the teacher or the facilitator can do some mirrored modeling where you set up your bells backwards, but it makes perfect sense for the students. And then while sitting across from you, it's very easy for them to follow the bells. So again, it's backwards for you, the right way for them, and it makes it very easy for them to do what you are doing. Finally, you can take your child to concerts or folk festivals or a local battle of the bands or anything where you can see other musicians performing. Ideally, you can find shows that your child is interested in that will kind of draw them in even more. And if it does mean a more expensive concert ticket every now and then, it will help them connect with music as an art form to understand. It's an awesome form of self-expression and ideally they will develop their own sense of self-worth based on their own musical ability and bring them to concerts will definitely help to inspire them along that path. Secret number 10, regular practice. Our final tip for today is to make practice regular and consistent. Making music a part of your routine is one of the best ways to ensure that your child is getting the benefits of a music education. There are a ton of cognitive, emotional, and social benefits of music lessons, and you can read more about them on our research page at prodigiesmusic.com. If you take private lessons for one hour every week, that's going to help you learn more about your instrument and be a really good start for you. To actually memorize the musical sounds and hone those technical skills means that you should be practicing at least five days a week for 15 to 30 minutes at the minimum. If you can practice for more, that's even better, but this idea of five days a week and 15 minutes a day is a practical and effective way to stay on track. You can download our free instrument app, that way you'll always have a colorful instrument to practice with in your back pocket. You can incorporate those hand signs into your daily routines as well, and you can easily sing and engage with those solfege hand signs, because you always got them with you. Yep, actionable steps that you can take to help ensure daily practice are getting a practice calendar. Maybe it's a superhero calendar, maybe the printable one that we have here at Prodigies, but track your practice and encourage yourself to mark five X's or checks or smiley faces each week on that calendar, even if it's just for five or 10 or 15 minutes each day. We've got a little bonus tip coming up. We're gonna share some of our favorite apps with all of you, but getting going with lots of musical instruments or activities or apps will help you to keep this regular practice fresh. And it means that there's always something fun and musical right at your child's fingertips. Yeah, and there's definitely value in sticking to one instrument or method for a span of time, but with young kids who have a shorter attention span, it's worth having a pretty big bag of tricks for keeping them engaged and learning, even if it's not on their main instrument the whole time. Now, if you stuck around for all 10 tips, we do have this bonus tip here. I want to quickly share this awesome list. It's some of our favorite music apps for the iPad. This is really a conversation for another day, but give this a quick screenshot because there is a ton of awesome information here. Most of these are iPad apps, some Android apps, and these are going to help you and your kids explore the world of music even further. So that's it for the 10 tips, but we're gonna answer a few frequently asked questions. So if you still have questions, stick around. Hopefully you learned some new insights about teaching your kids music. Don't forget that number one tip of meaningful exposure to individual musical notes during early childhood. Even if you don't end up using Prodigy's music, this should definitely give you a good outline of the key areas and avenues for teaching your kids music. And if you wanna take a lot of the guesswork out of it and work with a method that's tried, true, and produces amazing results, then sign up for your free 30-day trial to prodigies.com. You'll be able to access all of our courses, videos, and PDFs. There's over 550 colorful lessons for young kids. You can start with kids as early as age one. There are difficult lessons for kids 12, 13, 14 years old. So definitely check that out at prodigiesmusic.com. So thank you so much for sticking around for our 10 tips for teaching music. Next, we are gonna dive into a little FAQ. Here are some of our most commonly asked questions about prodigiesmusic.com. Number one, when should I start this with my child? Well, assuming that your child is above age two or three, the answer is that you should probably start as soon as possible. 
Like we talked about, getting two years of pitch training during the critical period for auditory development is the key to long-term musical understanding, and there really isn't a good reason to delay. If you have a one or two year old, we definitely recommend checking out our Tadagi's playlist. And of course, these desk bells and songbooks are a great place to start with infants and toddlers too. As business owners and work from home parents, our daughter does have a fair amount of screen time, maybe more than either of us would really like to admit. And while I don't encourage that for everyone or for especially young kids, if you're like us and you find yourself needing this screen time babysitter every now and then, well then we've got some good news. Prodigies is ad free, it's wholesome, and it's super educational. The episodes are also relatively simple compared to the flashy effects of popular TV shows, so we're not exposing your kids with thousands of images and cheap graphics every minute. Number two, how will I fit prodigies into my daily schedule? All of us parents and teachers are overwhelmed, we're busy, we've got kids, work, responsibilities, and prodigies music makes it easier than ever to get music lessons right into your home at any time. With multiple ways to view directly from your TV, smartphone, or computer, you can fire up your music lessons easily. Your kids will be singing, hands on and playing their way through some amazing music lessons in just a couple of minutes. It only takes about 30 seconds to fire up that lesson, set up your bells, and you're ready to go. Number three, what kind of support will I get as I move through the program? We have an amazing support team here at Prodigies. They are just an email away, support at prodigies.com, or you can often find them hanging out in our website's live chat, and you can also reach us by phone as well. On top of that, we have an amazing community inside of our Facebook group. You can drop by the Facebook group to find lots of parents and teachers sharing tips and having discussions. So that's another great place to take your questions or your ideas to connect with the community. Question number four, does Prodigies use movable dough or fixed dough? Here at Prodigies, the vast majority of our material is in C major, so there aren't too many songs where this really comes up. For the songs where we do leave C major, we are usually in fixed do, which promotes that skill of absolute pitch and is more consistent for young kids who've memorized the sounds of the solfege. And when we want to touch on movable concepts, we use the scale degrees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, we know that there are many classroom music teachers who don't get their kids during early childhood and therefore they prefer movable dough, which is a little easier to teach to older kids. And so we are working on creating movable dough and fixed dough versions of the few tunes where we do leave C major. We're not there yet, but within the not too distant future, we will have both that movable and fixed dough option. Question number five, I'm already a music teacher. Do I really need to use prodigies? For all of you experienced music educators, you know what it's like standing in front of a classroom and trying to get all of your kids to play together in time. You don't really have any free hands, you don't really have the ability to move around the room all that much, and if you were to stop conducting for a couple seconds, your ensemble would probably fall apart pretty quickly. With Prodigies, you can put on a performance track and all of a sudden you've got a melody part, a chord part, some percussion parts, and the solfege hand signs, and even lyrics. This means that you can have your kids following along, getting their ensemble practice all together at the same time with the same video, and you can even be floating around the room helping out the kids who might need a little extra guidance. This will also free you up to track your kids' progress, set up that next activity, or just grab a quick sip from your water bottle. Also for music teachers and group leaders, we recently launched an LMS called Prodigy's Academy. The Academy has some more advanced features like Google Classroom and Clever integrations. It has group management, teacher reporting, student gamification, digital quizzes, and lots of other features that you can learn about at prodigies.com slash academy. Question number six, can I really afford these desk bells? We hear from people all the time we get it, we are parents, we know what it's like to be frugal, but these bells are not just a little toy. They are a really amazing instrument. They're well-tuned, they're durable, they're high quality. They sound great, they're gonna last you many, many years, and they're never gonna go out of tune. Unlike a guitar, which you can kind of tune or detune, these are gonna stay the same, making it more predictable and more consistent for your kids. If you've ever looked at quality music classroom instruments like ORF xylophones or marimbas, they can cost $500 to $2,500 for one instrument. 
Our desk bells are a fraction of that price and they're going to sound great, play easily, and last for a long time. So we are getting close to the end here and I don't want to eat up any more of your time. Thank you so much for sticking around for all of this. We hope you learned a lot. We hope you had a lot of fun. And if you have any unanswered questions, please reach out to us, support at prodigies.com. You can also check out prodigies.com slash help or slash research and find all of our documentation and frequently asked questions. Thank you so much for sticking around. We really appreciate you spending this time with us and we look forward to hearing from you. That's it for now. And until next time, I will see ya later, see ya later, see ya, see ya later.